It is customary for us to stand at the reading of the word. And the scripture tonight is taken from Matthew 18 and 12. 12 through 14. Matthew 18, 12 through 14. If you have it, say amen. amen. It reads as follows. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others on the hills and go out to search for the one that is lost? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he will rejoice over it more than more over, more than over the 99 that, he, that didn't wander away. In the same way, it is not my heavenly Father's will that even one of these little ones should perish. Father God, I just ask you right now, God, to bless your word. I ask you, Father God, to continue to lead me by your spirit. I bow down everything in me, Father God, that would get in the way. I'm asking you, Father, that you have your way and that you touch every heart in here, Father God, so that there would be no resistance to your will and your drawing, Father God. I thank you, Father God, that it's not me that has to convince the people, God, that the Holy Spirit's job is to convince the people. So I thank you, God, for getting out of the way, Father God, in doing what you have called me to do today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. As I said, this evening is going to be just a little bit different. <clears throat> I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to talk about a few things. And while we won't necessarily have points, there may be some things that you want to write down. Everybody is familiar with the scripture, Matthew 18, 12 through 14. And before I get started, I want to acknowledge my pastor and first lady who are still enjoying their time away. Well-deserved time away. I want to acknowledge them and I want to thank them for this opportunity and trusting me to be in the pulpit. Matthew 18 and 12, 12 through 14, is a familiar parable to everyone. It's talking about <clears throat> how the shepherd left the 99 who were found, who were safe, who were secure, and who were supported. He left the 99 to go find the one who had wandered off. And as is the title of my message tonight, I am that one. When I was reading this particular passage, I really began to think about the one person that God left his comfort zone for to go and get. Sunday, we talked about how he stepped down from his seat in heaven, how he laid down his life, and then he got back up so we could get back up. And even after all of that, he still has to come and get us. We still wander off. I remember one of the places that he found me was in a place of isolation. I had just gotten divorced. And I knew who I was when I went into my marriage, but when I came out, my identity had changed. 
because I had morphed it into the expectations of my partner. And see, that's a problem because the only expectation in regards to my identity that I need to be meeting are the ones that God has set, not another human being. And I knew that going in, but somewhere along the line, I wandered off. And by the end of my marriage, I was fed up. I felt invisible. I felt depressed. I felt tired. I was suicidal to the point to where I actually got a gun and held it for a long time and thought I could really fix everything and I wouldn't have to feel anything else, but I was simply desperate and trading one type of pain for another. While I was sitting on my bed with this gun, I remember crying out to God because there was no one else. Because, and it's not that I didn't have family, because I have family. I have very supportive family. And I, underst I understand that. But you know, sometimes family can't do it. Sometimes families don't have the words. They don't know what to say. They don't know what to do. And sometimes they just cannot do anything because it's not meant for them to do anything. And I cried out to the Lord in my isolation. And he heard me. Now, I would like to say I would like to say that it was automatic, that I immediately not want, I immediately didn't want to commit suicide, but that wouldn't be true. Because when God rescues you, when he sends somebody, it's a process. It's a process. But I remembered the process that I took, and I remembered God reminded me, when you come out, when you get past this, then you have a duty, you have an obligation to go help somebody else. And the way you help other people is to be transparent about where you were and not worry about how it's going to sound. Because see, it doesn't matter to me what you think. I love you, but it doesn't matter because I know what God told me to do. And he told me to be transparent about it. And you may think, you know, she's a leader. She's now a pastor, a pastor in the church. There are third, certain things that she shouldn't be sharing. I don't read that in the word. Because I've come to understand, and it took me a long time, a long time to get to this place. But I've come to understand that the more open I am, the more room I have to go help somebody else. The only one that's really supposed to be carrying burdens like that is the one that's already been on the cross. Amen. Amen. I am that one. You are that one. And as I continued to read this scripture, I felt like God was asking me questions. When is the last time you went out and found that one? When is the last time you reached out to somebody that you weren't so caught up in your pain that you just ignored somebody that you know was in pain? There's nowhere in the scripture that gives us the right or the license to ignore somebody else that's going through something just because we're going through something. We don't get to wait until ours is done before we go help somebody else. That is not the way it works. That is not the way it works. 
one of the things that God's really been dealing with me about is having a burden, a real, true, honest burden for the lost. I mean, a lot of us talk about it. A lot of us acknowledge that it's a problem, but that's as far as it goes. We know people that don't know God. But the reason why we don't say anything to the people we don't know God is because our lifestyles won't match up with the testimony that we're trying to give them. And that's kind of hard to explain. You're trying to win somebody over and they just saw you come out of the club. They just saw you curse somebody out. Pastor always emphasizes lifestyle. And it's not to say that we're looking for perfect people. It's not to say that. But we're looking for people who will be honest about where they are, realize that they're wrong, repent, get up, and keep it moving. Not those that realize they're wrong, make an excuse, and keep it moving. I've heard so many people talk about it's not Christianity that they hate, it's the Christians. Because they live one way on Sunday, and then Monday through Saturday, they're doing something else. And so it's hard for somebody who doesn't know Christ at all, or who is on the fence, to believe that Christianity is real. I was at the altar, and I had the privilege of talking with a young lady. And the prayer of salvation had just gone out. And I asked her, did you accept the Lord as your Savior? And her response was, I go to church. And I began to think how many other people believe that if I go to church, if I tithe, if I serve in the ministry, if I even attend the functions of the church, that that's the equivalent to being saved. But that's not what the word says. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, we have to confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised Jesus from the dead then we will be saved. So that means that we can't just think about it. We have to speak it out. When is the last time without you carrying a Bible, without a fish on your car, without a cross around your neck, without you playing Christian music, that somebody could tell that there was something about you about your life that was different. Where somebody could tell that you were a believer. When was the last time that somebody asked you about what you believe? When is the last time? For some of you, it'll be the first time. And that's okay. Our lifestyle for Christ should not be a secret. It should not be a secret. It should not be a secret. One of the things that I have learned is that I have a, I, we have a responsibility to reach others for Christ. And it's not something that we should have to be reminded of if, if we're true believers if we are true believers. And if we are true believers, then that's something that we shouldn't have to be reminded of. When I said that this service would be different because God's focus in this service is restoration and salvation. And I know prob people are probably saying, you know what, I've heard that before. I'm good, but it's you that I'm looking for. The ones that are saying, I've heard this before and I'm good. Because chances are, just like batteries, we need to be recharged. 
And I would hate for somebody to be thinking that they're good with God. And number one, they've never confessed him. They do everything for God. They're good to people. They take care of people. They give to charities. They serve. But they've never confessed him. And if you have not confessed him with your mouth, you are not going to see God. And like I said, I know this is simple. And I know this is probably repetitive. But I felt such an urgency on Sunday. Such an urgency. Because the rest of this day is not promised to us. It's not. We can say, you know what, I'm going to think about it. I'm going to think about where I am with God at this point. And I have often thought, why is it that a person who can try something for the first time get taken out while somebody who has done something 50 times gets another chance? See, that's not a question for me. That's a God question. But God is the one that decides who is one and done and who gets another chance. And since we don't know that, then we need to stop acting like we are going to have another opportunity to get it right before him. We need to quit acting like that because it's not true. The fact of the matter is we don't know. And I don't know about you, but as a believer, it bothers me to think that somebody believes sincerely that they're all right with God and they've never confessed him. That bothers me to think me as a believer and I have a relationship with them and I don't even know that because I haven't been sharing my faith or because my lifestyle hasn't made somebody want to ask questions about what I believe. As believers, that should bother you too. It's not just pastors. It's not just leaders. It's the body of Christ that is responsible for spreading the good news. We're all responsible for that. We're all responsible for that. One thing that I have to do that I have not done publicly, but I will do it now, is I need to acknowledge my pastor. And what I mean by that is, he's a good shepherd. He's a good shepherd. He is. He's a good shepherd. He's a good shepherd. And I know he shared the story about me coming to this church and telling him, I don't know why I'm here, because we have absolutely nothing in common. And that was the truth. And sometimes because people are so different from us, we think, how are we going to connect? What is our conversation going to be about? You know, we can't just talk about God all day. But I understood, I, I later understood that there was a reason that God placed me here. He had to change my thinking. He had to shake up some perceptions that I had. I'm going to be real. He had to shake up some perceptions that I had that I could not receive or I didn't understand what the connection was about. But since I've been here, I have freedom like I have never had before. And it feels good to be free. It feels good to be free. It feels good to be free. One of the ways to know how good your shepherd is, a characteristic of a good shepherd, is he knows when the sheep are uneasy. Our pastor... is very in tune with that. 
He's always watching even when you don't know it. I can't tell you how many times I've been at my job, minding my business, doing my job, and I've been uneasy about something. I've had something on my mind, and I told myself, I'm not talking to pastor about it. I don't want to talk to pastor about it. And I'll be darned, the phone will ring. And it'll say, Pastor Peoples. And I say, dang. But once I pick up the phone, of course, my tone is, I say, hey, Pastor. You know how we do. But after we have the conversation, I'm grateful that God put me on his heart to call and check about and check on me. I'm grateful for that. Another sign of a good shepherd, he knows when you're missing. And missing is just not physical. Because you could be here, pre you could be present in the body and your mind be somewhere else. And your heart be some, somewhere else. But a real shepherd, a real shepherd will be sensitive to that. Because God will let him know. A real shepherd. We have that in pastor. We have that in pastor. A real shepherd will know when to rescue and when to retreat. There are a lot of times when he does need to come and get us. But there are times when God is telling him, no, I need, the, I need you to keep your hands off. I need them to stay in that situation a little bit longer because if you go rescue them now, they'll be right back in it and it'll be worse. And I can tell you, Pastor is getting really, really, really good about listening to that because he, he loves to help. That's his heart for people. He has a true heart for people. A real shepherd is not only accountable to others, but he holds others accountable. He doesn't ask us to do anything that he's not willing to do. How many pastors do you know that will dress down on the stage, preach a word, and when service is over, he's got on a t-shirt and some shorts, and he's cleaning the church just like everybody else. And if somebody walked in, you wouldn't even know he was the pastor. How many other shepherds do you know like that? Another characteristic of a good shepherd, he'll come after you. He'll come after you. And I don't mean that in a stalking kind of way. But he'll come after you to make sure that you're okay. And if he's not coming, he's asking. So the only reason that you would fall through the cracks or get dropped is if you don't want to be connected. See, the pastor, while he shepherds everybody, because all of us have a responsibility to care about one another, so if he can't do it because of all the people, then we should be connected enough to people inside the body that somebody should miss us and somebody should reach out to us. And if that's not happening, is it because you haven't made yourself available? Is it because you don't want to be connected? Is it because you don't want somebody in your business? A shepherd is honorable. His purpose is to guide and direct in a particular direction. Our pastor does that. Our pastor does that. So I just want to take the time to say how grateful I am for Pastor Lawrence Peoples and First Lady Nichelle Peoples.
They paid a great price. They have paid a great price to stay in the race. They paid a great price. If you can imagine being in a relationship just with your family, your immediate family, having to deal with 10 or 12 people, and then coming to church and shepherding 300 people, and those 300 people probably has, have three or four personalities, so you got to deal with them too. I mean, think about it. Think about it. Think about it. It's real. We have to learn. We have to give honor where honor is due. And pastor couldn't do what he does without first lady. He couldn't do it without her. He could not do it without her. I want to ask, if anybody in here is unsure, if you have any doubt, any doubt at all, that if you left tonight, if you have any doubt about where you would go, We're going to have an opportunity to get that right. Don't worry about what people think. They don't have a heaven or hell to put you in. But I really need you to get real with yourself. If you have never confessed with your mouth, if you've only thought about it in your mind, but you've never spoke it out, if you have never confessed Jesus is Lord please please take care of that tonight before you leave please please it is so important it's so important to be in right standing with God Instead, in his word today, he's not wanting anybody to perish. He's not wanting to lose anybody, to leave a whole group for one. You are that one, just like I was that one. Your kids could be that one. Your parents can be that one. But that one is important. That one is important. So I'm asking. I'm pleading because this burden is real for me. I am pleading with you to please. If you knew the Lord at one time, but you kind of strayed away, or you got some things going on that you know he wouldn't be happy with, and you're aware of it, get it right. Get it right. Be real about where you are. It is that important. And when there's an urgency, like I felt Sunday, for salvation, we don't know when he's coming back. I don't want to be like those movies I've seen where he came back and people are gone, but I'm still standing here. You need to be sure of your salvation. You need to be absolutely sure. So if you got to return to God, do that. To make sure. To make sure. It's that important. It is that important. And you cannot take it for granted. You cannot. Because you never know if you're that one and done. So I need everybody to stand. If you are not sure and you want to be absolutely sure, 
You've been going to church for a long time. You've been serving. You're a faithful tither, but you don't really know if you ever really confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and ask him to come into your life. If you're, if you're not sure, if you don't remember, come down to the altar. Everybody needs to be absolutely sure this is nothing to play with. We're talking about where you're going to spend eternity because you're going to spend it somewhere. There's no purgatory. There's heaven or hell. There's no middle ground. And I understand this may not be what you came to hear. But God knew somebody. Somebody. Somebody needed to hear it. Somebody needed to be reminded. Somebody. 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 I'm opening up the altar. If you need to get it right, if you need to make sure, this is not rolling dice. Take the opportunity. This is God's leading. This is not my idea. This is God's leading. He knows something that we don't know. He knows something we don't know. If you have never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you've never confessed him, please come to the altar. If you want to make sure and say it again, the altar is open. But one thing that I do know, like I said, it's not up to me. It's not about me I'm trying to convince anybody. If God is tugging at your heart, pay attention. Even when you think you're okay, if God is tugging at your heart, pay attention. Yield to that. Don't question it, just yield to it. It's that important. And you may be here tonight and you may say, you know what? I never have asked Christ into my life, but I'm not ready because I don't want to stop doing what I'm doing. Well, I understand that because we've all been there. But you're here for a reason tonight. And God specifically wanted this night to be about salvation and about restoration. You're not here by accident. Be obedient to what the Spirit is leading you to do. Please be obedient. Anybody else? Please don't miss your moment. Don't miss your moment. the 99 to come and get us. Oh, glory, glory, glory. It's that important. We're that important.
about us, to rescue us. Not just one time, not just two times, not just ten times. But every time we call. Please don't miss your moment. Please don't miss your moment. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. The next one is not promised. The next one is not promised. Yes, God. Yes, God. Forever. 